John here with RipeWave Audio, back a fourth time with Sony's $3,200 flagship AV receiver, the STR-AZ7000ES. Now, if you've been following us all along here, you might have seen the first video in this series, which we did an overview and we compared it against several of its peers before unboxing this unit. And then in part two, we got into the setup and configuration, the calibration of this unit using Sony's proprietary DCAC9 uh, technology for calibration. And then in the third part, we got into some of the user experiences and the sound modes, inclu including the uh, much talked about uh, Sony spatial sound mapping technology that can be added as part of the calibration process. Now in this video, we are actually going to give our comparisons against a lot of brands out there, Yamaha, Marantz, Denon, Onkyo, Emotiva, Anthem, and Arcam. And these are all receivers and processors that we've looked at in-house over the last year. So it's fresh in our mind. And of course we have our reference models that are part of that set right here. We can do an ABC comparison and that's what we're gonna do in this video. But first we're gonna cover down on a few things that we didn't cover in earlier parts like how long this takes to start up and its mobile app, the Sony Music Center. So let's take a look at these things. And the first one uh, I wanted to cover is the startup time. This is something that has been brought up of, as a negative of, of some models. Uh, I don't think Sony has been criticized here, but it seems that a lot of these products do take a long time to boot up. Uh, from cold boot, the Arcam has been one of the fastest that we've seen, 37 seconds from a cold start. Uh, Mono Price and Emotiva are somewhere around 86 to 90 seconds from a cold boot. Uh, but what they differed from the Arcam was they were able to go in their fast start or standby startups around 11, 12 seconds versus Arcam's 36 seconds. So there really wasn't much a difference between standby and cold boot with Arcam. Now with Sony, we've measured this as well. Cold boot was around 90 seconds, which compared to mono price and Emotiva, but from standby, it was almost instantaneous, about a one or two seconds, closer to one second from going from standby to a usable state. And I think this is pretty good. So uh, if you're interested in that uh, metric, uh, that uh, could be important to you. Now let's talk about Sony's Music Center. Now they do have an app. I wasn't quite aware of this when we did the prior videos. And I think one of you pointed it out to me that this is a way to get in and see more operational uh, user interface versus the web page view that we looked at earlier, uh, which was more for configuration. And we have been using that as we've been doing our sound tests. But this is downloadable from the Google Play uh, store or the app store from Apple. And they say you can do a lot of things with this app. So it's used for multi-room uh, wireless sound. Of course, Sony has their speakers that work uh, in their ecosystem uh, here, and they can even plug in to this model some, some of the wireless uh, products that they have do. But they do Bluetooth pairing. They can pair uh, over Ethernet as well, over the network. Uh, it has access to the, some of the sound parameters and, and the equalization that is present in whatever device that you're connecting to, including this receiver. Uh, you can check the versions and, and things like that. So we got into this, and I'm going to give you a peek at this uh, now. I'll be uh, showing you what this looks like. So if you bring up a phone, I have an iOS device. I don't have uh, Android devices. But if you launch the Music Center app, it will connect to your last device. I'll even ask you if you want to rate it. But we're going to close that down here and uh, look at the STRAZ7000ES interface here. And it does let you go into a variety of uh, features here. 
uh, lets you choose the zone that you want to work with. I'm always using the main zone in my case. Uh, it can get into your library. You can select any of the inputs that you have on this unit. You can even get into uh, something like Amazon Music uh, or Spotify as you see fit. Now, if you want to get into the settings of your receiver, you hit the settings here. There's also a information in the three dots in the upper hand here, but doesn't get you to the same information. Uh, there's some basics here uh, on that, but the settings button, uh, the settings at the below all the inputs, if you hit that settings there, this is where you can get in and adjust the sound. You can choose the equalizer. Now, if you remember, the equalizer in this unit is just a bass and treble cut and boost. So you don't get anything more with the app here. Uh, with the equalizer, uh, you can adjust the sound field here. So go from auto format to code, and I'm glad they're not using the AF. D abbreviation here, and they're spelling it out. That's a lot more clear. Dolby mode, etc. cetera. Um, put the auto enhancer on. So the same features you have from the remote, from the um, front of the machine when you have the, the door removed. Uh, put on the DSD native format. Put on pure direct. Uh, use your ceiling speakers as front speakers. You can put those on whether you have the 360 spatial sound mapping turned on and how you want to do your calibration. Now, I do feel that this app is still a little lacking. Yes, you can go in and browse some of the features uh, in here uh, and, and get to your music. Uh, if you have an uh, Amazon Prime music uh, subscription, it will give you access to that and then they have you stream it over to your receiver. I was having trouble to get the AirPlay to work. I got to figure out how to get the code and all that, but I did get Bluetooth to send it. Of course, I'm not a big fan of Bluetooth. While I have the calibration up here, I did want to speak. I did play around between engineer and front reference. Now, if you recall from the prior videos when we did our calibration, uh, I set it to engineer. Now, this is the Sony uh, what they use for their engineering and their reference within Sony. But front reference, what it does is it profiles your front speakers and tries to make all other speakers in your system have the same characteristics of sound as your front speakers. And in playing with this and going back and forth, I like the front reference better than the engineer one from Sony. I feel I use that most often. The flat one, it's acceptable, but I do find that it's better to make it sound like my own front reference speakers, and this is where I pretty much will leave it. So that is the Sony app called Music Center. Again, I wish it showed more. Uh, I find this whole unit lacking when it comes to showing me what the source material is, and what the output is and what my sound modes are going to be. Uh, they've taken out a lot of the technical interfaces, but then you don't know what it's, what's going on. And the, I've said this before, the company I think that's done this the best is Monoprice with their HTP One, uh, clearly showed you source versus output and had you, it gave you a lot of control over what the sound modes are. And here it's a little vague of what's happening. You know, you have to know in your head that in order to put on the 360 sound mapping, I have to use auto format decode or AFD, either AFD music or movie. So that's one gripe that I have um, with, these, with this unit. Let's talk about the calibration process. There's a lot of numbers in here. They determine the levels, how much they're going to raise or cut any given speaker to make them all balanced. Uh, they have a distance from listening position, which is pretty common with a receiver or processor. They also have, as part of that, the distance to the screen, which could be different than this distance to your 
center speaker, but mine happens to be the same, 13 feet. Then they have a distance from screen. So this is relative to the screen, like where is your front speakers? So front left and right can be very close to the screen. Then they have the height, and this is the height from the floor. And when I was measuring this manually, I, I did it to about where the tweeter was. Uh, and, and Sony seems to get it fairly close to the way I do it manually. One thing I will point out was when uh, I did this again, the first time I ran it, I let Sony do all the distances and everything, and it came up with some. And I wasn't sure if I should go and change those after the fact. So what I used is preset number two, and, and see preset one was the first time I ran calibration here. Preset two, I did it again, but I manually measured everything. I listened to it for a bit, compared it to that, and then I ran the DCAC9 calibration on preset two. It took a lot of the values as the initial input on the wizard, uh, which I thought was nice. It didn't go to its standard default. It used what I put in, uh, and then I could just hit next. But it did, through its calibration, modify several of those settings that I did manually. So it will do that. Now you still have the choice at the end to change it to what you believe is the correct distances. But I think for the case here, I was happy just to leave it in its own calibration, knowing that it had that as the starting point. Now one thing I will note here too is uh, when I ran this first calibration, it set all my speakers to large. I don't feel they're large. So I manually changed all but my front speakers to small. Uh, they were all small for one point, and I, then I did the front large and the rest small. It seemed to be a little better that way. And then um, set some crossovers for it, because if they're set to large, they're not going to set the crossover. So I did that, and I listened to it, and the thing sounds pretty good. It sounds very good. Now, the one complaint I have is the bass. I think they overemphasize the bass. There isn't a lot, I don't even know if, how much they even do for, for bass control. Uh, there's no real mention it in the manual. There's a, really, both subwoofers are run in parallel, so there's a single output. Uh, even though there's two connections in the back of this, it's just a single output. And I don't, know if DCAC9 really does anything for, for bass. I mean, there's a low pass filter beyond that. I don't know, but I think this is a little um, too emphasis on that. And I feel that the sound stage is really wide and that's good. Uh, but I feel like things could be slightly clearer, but that's a being picky because I do think this puts out a nice clear sound if you like that extra bass, and I don't think it's entirely articulate bass though, it's not entirely clear to me. I think it's a little too overdone. Now I can play around with this in the future and back off on that, cut, do some cutting on the subwoofer and see if that improves my, my liking on that. But out of the box, how it does its calibration, I feel, it's a little heavy on the bass. What I decided to do is see, let's see, let's see how good their speaker relocation is. That's part of this. Because my speakers are pretty well thought out. Um, maybe not 100% ideal, but it's fairly close, a uh, little better than most theater setups. So I said, let me just take one of my speakers, and I decided to take the front left, and put it in a wild position. So I moved it up three feet and maybe one foot towards the center of the room and then re-ran the calibration using my other preset. And you know what? It handled it pretty darn good. Uh, I, of course, I wouldn't want this speaker in this position, but the process is quick. I mean, you've got a couple minutes to spare. You can run your calibration again, 
I just wish they gave you more slots. Two slots is not enough. Uh, I can envision, because this is so quick and easy to do the calibration, somebody wanting to have five, six, ten different configurations depending on what's going on in their room. Maybe you're moving furniture around because if you, when you have more people, you bring in a couple of extra chairs, maybe you have to move a speaker, like one of your front towers or something to accommodate more people in the room, and you still want it to sound good, run the calibration another time, and it puts out good results. Just give me another slot to store it in. And then while I had this in this wacky position, I used my ABC switch, and I went over to the Emotiva, and I went over to the Marantz, and it's, I mean, of course, I didn't balance the system with that in that position, but it just called my attention, you know, how much this is really accounting for it. Uh, and I even went to the preset two and left that speaker in it. So I'm on the Sony going from one preset to another, one where it's in its normal position, one when it's in the wacky position. And when it's in the normal position, or if I'm listening to the Marantz or the Emotiva, it sounds weird. It sounds like that speaker is too dominant in the room. I can, I can hear it all the time. But when I go to the preset where I ran the calibration with this speaker in its wacky position, and it sounds balanced. Sony did a good job with the, with the speaker relocation. This tells me this might be the ideal receiver for somebody who doesn't have speakers in the ideal positions. And the fact that they've accounted for, and I haven't tried this, but if you have all ceiling speakers and to make those appear as they're coming down and being more at ear level, I, they're trying to accommodate those who don't have ideal rooms or speaker locations. Now, Maybe I'm going a stretch too far with the ideal rooms because somebody did weigh in on this channel and said, it may, may be, I'm not sure how they're calibrating on this, but you know, they may be assuming everybody has a square or rectangular box for their room. And what if I have an L sticking out? Now my room has an L sticking out, you can't see it. Uh, and it seems to do pretty well, but what if you have vaulted ceiling or all this? So there's a lot of circumstances. I, don't know for sure how they're accommodating different room types, but different speaker locations, they do seem to balance outright. So I'll retract a little bit on the room because I don't know, but on the speaker locations, I think they've done a good job here. So if you compare the wacky position to the normal one, the wacky ones down in the bottom, the normal ones at the top, you can see now that that front left, instead of being 11 foot seven distance from listening position is six foot 10. So bringing that in and you got, um, we got good results. So here's the part you've been waiting for. How does it line up against its peers? This is how we think it did. We feel that this is somewhere between a tier one and a tier two product. I gave it a little edge and say, it's probably in tier one. That's why I still made it green. The sound quality may not be as good as Yamaha, Monoprice, Arcam, Emotiva, and Anthem. As far as clarity and good bass reproduction, but it's more spacious. So while as it didn't go as high on being as rich, it sounded more spacious than the others. So if you prefer, prefer being more spacious, you might actually uh, say this is better than the others. But if you're into preciseness and, and clarity of the content coming out the speakers, I think you'll prefer the other ones that I have rated above it. But I do say this is better than the Cinema 40, the 4800 from Denon, even the Onkyo TXR C60 uh, that I put in the tier two, and of course, better than the tier three. So there you have it. This is kind of my assessment of how this sounds uh, against its peers. What are your thoughts? Do you think I'm on track? 
It's okay if you're not, but I'd like to know why. I'll put those comments in. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. And if you want to take your involvement to the next level, we do have our Patreon channel at www.patreon.com slash ripewave. Or even if you want to give me a one-time donation by hitting that thanks button, those super thanks really mean a lot uh, to being able to bring in this this equipment uh, where I don't have suppliers just sending it to me. I have to purchase these just like everybody else. And there is no cost to hit that bell notification so you can subscribe to this channel. I really hope to uh, increase my subscribers over the next two months, end up 2023 in a very strong way. Can you help me do that? I would really appreciate that. And so with this, as we always say, keep evolving your audio experience.